In the last video, we looked at discounting and why you place a lower value on the costs and benefits in the future. In this video, we will first look at how to treat costs and benefits that happen in the past, then how to analyze alternatives with different useful lives, and finally some problems when discounting late, late into the future. First, let's look at sunk costs. Let's say this is our timeline, and this is the present year, year zero. Let's pretend there's a project already in progress with costs and benefits payoffs that look like this. This project is for a solar power plant, and we want to know if switching to a coal power plant is a better alternative. When conducting our analysis, we wouldn't want to count anything that happens before year zero, before this year. We're only concerned with changes that can be made in the future. Those costs before now are sunk costs, because we can't take them back. Those benefits before year zero have already been received. Maybe we would include dismantling and or selling the solar plant's capital in the coal alternative, but we wouldn't just take the beginning of the solar project as year zero or something like that. That would just be comparing a solar power plant to a coal plant. But our future alternatives, as of now, as of year zero, are basically continue on with the solar project or switch to coal. Whether we switch to coal or not, we've still paid for the solar power plant, so it shouldn't affect our decision. We're only concerned with decisions we can make starting now, so we're unconcerned with the past costs and benefits. Next, let's look at comparing project alternatives that have different useful lives. Let's say this is the characteristic shape of a project with respect to time. So for example, let's look at asphalt road work. In the beginning, you have the larger costs to install the road, and every year there's maintenance costs to fill potholes or repaint the lines or do other repairs. And then every year, people receive the benefits from being able to use the road. Okay, number of considerations. First, when does the project start? What if the previous road was just gravel and the town was tired of regraveling it every five years and just wants to pave it. Does it have to happen immediately? If the gravel road was put in recently, maybe there are benefits yet to be received by waiting a few years until that gravel road has gone through its life cycle. Starting immediately or waiting would have to be tested as separate alternatives. Maybe the benefits gained by the asphalt road are so much greater that it's actually not worth waiting. Next, uh, when do the costs start and when do the benefits start? For a paved road, there would be the initial construction costs. There would probably be little maintenance for the first several years and some subsequent maintenance costs that increase over time. Benefits would start as soon as the road has opened, probably in the first year. Then how long do the benefits and costs run for? How long is the project life? There's no set rule for deciding how long a project's life is, and it will depend on the project. For roads of any design, it would probably be the time until the road needs complete replacing. You wouldn't take this as the project life, or this. Otherwise, it might not be analyzing the life of one project, but part of one, or one and part of another. What if two different alternatives look like this? One an asphalt road with a project life of 20 years, and one a gravel road with a project life of 5 years. How do we compare them? We could try cutting this one down by a quarter, but we wouldn't be accounting for the greater benefits over time gained by the relatively large upfront costs. It would be better just to assume that this other project is repeated four times over the course of the 20 years. For other kinds of projects, maybe a project that doesn't necessarily repeat, like a hydroelectric dam. Or something. Just like how we set up the spatial boundaries trying to include everyone that's involved, when setting up the temporal boundaries, we want to try to find across all time the flows of costs and benefits. So for something like a dam, this project would start with the planning or construction costs and end maybe at the estimated time of its disassembly and removal, 40 years into the future let's say. But there's a problem we can start to see when we discount these long projects. Discounting late, late into the future can make the future seem like it has no value. Depending on our discount rate, 40 years into the future may look completely irrelevant. At say a 5% discount rate that might be used in a developed nation, the last year of the project, year 40, is only weighted at 14% of its original amount. At a 10% discount rate that might be used in a developing nation, the costs and benefits are reduced to 2.2%. Let's say we had a project that was 60 years long. It would be reduced to 5.35% at a 5% discount rate in the last year, and decimal 32% at a 10% discount rate. That weight we're giving to the future is so small it basically doesn't matter. For projects concerned with very long-term effects, like global warming, this is going to cause problems. For global warming, large costs right now might prevent even larger costs or loss of benefits in the future. But if we discount the future so much, it can seem like those future costs aren't really a big deal. But those costs today are. To fix this, some suggest using a lower discount rate, say 1-3% to for the distant future. And it's suggested this is how people actually value the future. The near future, 1-30 to or 40 years, we are impatient. We want that TV with more resolution than the real world, and we want it now. 
We think about the alternatives and we use a relatively higher discount rate, but for the distant future we tend to plan ahead, are more patient and will discount lower. Planning later into the future also tends to apply to our children and to our grandchildren, whose consumption we won't discount as much as our own. Others suggest that normal discount rates and seemingly irrelevant futures are economically efficient for the usual reasons. By assigning a higher value to the present, we can increase prosperity and well-being greater than the cost of something like global warming and overcome those huge future costs or negative benefits. That's what the discount rate is supposed to communicate. If these huge future costs have a very small present value, that means they're easier to pay off. Along these same lines, it's suggested that these normal discounting rates are fine, but that these moral issues about how we treat the costs that will be paid by future generations fall outside the role of discounting and should be handled beside discounting, rather than trying to address these problems by changing the discount rate. But these are all things that economists seem to go back and forth on. In the next video, we're going to look at discounting again and how to calculate the net present value.